Good morning, everyone, and welcome to today's virtual bridge session hosted by Jisk and CDN. These sessions have been running Tuesday to Friday at 11 a.m., and next week there will be a bit of a gap as the Jisk Connect More event is taking place. Connect More this year is both virtual and free for members, and the theme is elevating the student learning experience. If you are interested in the virtual bridge, you'll almost certainly be interested in much of the programme. I'll put a link in the chat a little later, and please consider signing up. In today's session, we are lucky to be able to hear the experience and tips from Connor Bradley of Borders College. Connor has experienced as both a science educator for seven years and another seven years working in e-learning and IT, so has a perfect balance and experience of being the virtual bridge that allows the magic to happen. In his time at Borders, Connor has worked on a number of transformative projects, uh, almost £7 million, pounds, South of Scotland Digital Hub and Spoke VC Learning Project across colleges, schools, businesses and charities in the region, Fully seamless digital experience for college students across application, enrolment, induction and e-learning through Moodle Teams and Office 365. And as well as creating an environment and supporting the work that meant that Borders won the 2019 JISC sponsored CDN Award for Digital Learning. The title of Connor's presentation is Bridging the Divide, IT and Teaching and Learning. And Connor has chosen the track for Kendi's virtual playlist, which is One More Bridge to Cross by The Supremes and The Four Tops. A great tune and appropri appropriately enough, a great collaboration. Take it away, Connor. Thanks very much for that, Owen. I'll just share my screen here. OK, hopefully that's coming up for everybody all right. <clears throat> Seeing some thumbs up from Kendi, so that's a, always a good sign. OK, so Bridging the Divide, IT uh, and Teaching and Learning. So. Just introducing myself, there, obviously, Owen's done a great job there. So I'm Connor Bradley uh, at Borders College. My role is I'm the project manager for digitalization of delivery. I actually work within the IT team um, to kind of help prioritize uh, projects and work, especially ones that cross between IT and the teaching and learning area. Don't worry if um, you want to grab any of the stuff that's in this PowerPoint. At the end, I'll leave a slide up. It's got a link. <coughs> That you'll be able to click on to download a copy of this so if anyone's furiously taking notes it will all be available afterwards so so um <clears throat> why the divide this is the first question obviously if, we, if there's a divide that needs to be bridged how come there is a divide why do people think that uh, there should be any divide at all between it and the teaching and learning uh, areas so <clears throat> to try and educate myself a bit better in terms of this divide i went off to google image search and I went to look for a stock photo of a lecturer and a stock photo of an IT technician. And what I came up with was this. So obviously we've got our lecturer on the left here. They live in cardigans. Um, they're always in front of a blackboard. There's always a picture of some kind of book in the background. Um, and they're with students as well, obviously. You know, they're never spotted in the wild on their own. You know, they're always with some students. And the right there, we've got our IT technician. Um, there's almost never anybody anywhere near them. They're always on their own, uh, always elbow deep in something with a lot of wires. Um, and obviously they're a, a guy as well. They're also male, of course. So these were the stock images that came up on Google. I thought, well, maybe we could do a bit better than that. So I went off and I had a quick look on um, the Creative Commons image search, see if there's anything else out there that so maybe a bit more interesting. And when I searched for lecturer, the first image I got was this one which I thought, there you go, I think that's, that's pretty good. That demonstrates to us all that there's all sorts of people out there lecturing. It's, you know, they're just people like the rest of us, you know, in our great diversity. And I thought, great, let's see what IT technician throws up, hopefully something suitably, you know, interesting and diverse. And I got the white guy on his own, double deep in wires, you know. So there's maybe a particular issue with like, you know, IT and that we need to look at, but that's probably off for another discussion. But my point here really is that in terms of teaching and learning teams, IT teams, they're just people at the end of the day. Um, if there's kind of a, a gap between them or a difference in kind of perspective on things, I don't think it's really about the role itself and the people that are involved in it so much. Uh, as I would say, it's probably more about who these teams work with and work for and the demands that are placed on them. So I threw up a quick list here of the kind of people uh, the kind of things that people would say if you ask them within these teams, you know, who are you working for? What's your kind of goal? What are you trying to achieve? Um, there is some crossover, but there's some differences as well there. Um, and also what I 
served to wanted to highlight with this one was that on the IT side, a lot of the IT team staff will spend a lot of time with operations, systems, things like that, maintaining them, keeping them going. Whereas the teaching and learn, learning, they're spending a lot of time actually with the students. So even though IT, you know, one of the people that we're working for are students, we don't necessarily see a lot of them. Um, they're not necessarily our kind of heaviest face-to-face -face users. If there's a lot of problems or issues out there that students have, very often they'll come straight to teaching and learning staff rather than to us. And it can sometimes be difficult to actually kind of get out there, meet students, see what's going on. Uh, and I think sometimes that's where the division can come from. Those different demands on who you're working with, what you're trying to deliver, the demands on your time. Apologies, obviously, to everybody in either camp because I've clearly missed off the other 50 items that should be on both of those lists. Uh, but as I say, it serves to kind of give you an idea of that, where the idea of the divide might be coming from. So again, thinking about this divide, I was thinking, how do you bring this divide together? And as always, it's good to go off and find a nice meaningful quote from someone. And there's one from uh, the American essayist, David Theroux, so he was saying there, so it's not enough to be busy, even the ants are busy. The question is, what are we actually busy about? What are we trying to achieve and we're trying to do? And for me, that's really the key of bridging the divide and bringing people together is getting everyone on the same page about what are we actually trying to achieve together? Because at the end of the day, we're all working in the same institutions. We're all supporting each other. We have to have something that brings us together. And for me, what's bringing people together should be a shared vision. Um, I could already almost hear eyes rolling to the backs of heads here about, you know, this is going to be a real corporate speak talk about, you know, a shared vision and a goal and the rainbows and, you know, where we're going, all this stuff. But just because it's, you know, fairly simplistic doesn't mean it's not true. And I think for everybody within your organization, whether you're teaching and learning, IT, you know, support groups, students, thinking about where they're trying to get to and how you're going to get there is actually really, really important. So having a vision is one step. That's, you know, something that hopefully your organization's already got in terms of kind of a strategy or, you know, you might have a, a strategy for your particular area that articulates it uh, in a kind of more precise way for your group. But obviously the difficult bit after that is getting people to actually share in that vision because as much as every organization has a strategy and they would say they have a goal and a vision all those things, the difficulty is actually getting people to buy into that and say, yeah, that's it's not just the organization's vision, that's actually my vision as well. That's what I want. I do agree with that. Uh, and that for me comes down to four things. So the most important four things I feel for that is we've got leadership making sure that it's been promoted from above, it's consistent. Communication, we're talking about the vision all the time, we're tying everything back to it, it's something that comes up, it's not just something that sits in a strategy document that sits on the internet or a website somewhere and nobody ever actually opens. Um, making progress towards that vision visible, so how do people actually know that what they do is helping us get to what's in the vision? And then last of all, there's probably a couple of ways you could phrase this one. For me, I'd like to say fight to do less, but do it better. Uh, other people would say kind of like boxing smart or kind of, you know, being clever about how you do it. But I think it's really important that everybody is super, super uh, kind of time poor, as well, let's say at this moment. And the question is always, how can we get more done, but, you know, do it more efficiently? So we have to be really careful about making sure that what we do and we choose to do is really important and it ties back to that vision. So I'm going to talk through a couple of quick slides about the vision at Borders College. Not so much because we think this is the best vision. Every organization, I, I definitely believe, should have its own vision that's right for its area. Um, this is just a kind of a slice of Borders College's kind of strategy and vision uh, as it relates to teaching and learning and IT. Uh, but I'm just going to talk through it as an example because it kind of helps to talk through some of these areas and why uh, they help hopefully tie back to those four kind of ideas that we're aiming for. So in terms of where we feel we're going for our linking together our teaching and learning and IT, we're starting with this position of a, kind of a fairly simple statement that content for students, students must be able to access all the written, visual, video, etc. content that they would in class online. There's not really any reason these days where if you're sharing something with your students in the classroom, 
you likely written it on a computer, found it on a computer, printed it out from, you know, something connected to a computer. So there's not really any reason for your content not to be accessible online. We know it makes a difference to students. We know it's what they want. We know that there's lots of reasons why students might not be able to access it kind of face to face in the classroom, even before all the stuff that's happened with uh, COVID-19. Um, the college, obviously, we worked with lots of things like uh, people who kind of in workplaces, single parents, things like that, they couldn't always necessarily make every single lesson. So having that content available all the time really did make a difference to them. We know there's limits to that as well though. So we've got a statement there saying, for practical demonstrations, every effort must be made to replicate this online. So for some areas it's easier than others, but we've had some fantastic work from all sorts of areas. So plumbing, electricians, hairdressing, They've made lots of like really interesting videos and things about practical demonstrations there. They don't overtake being there in person and kind of, you know, the practical content, stuff like that. But the more that we can put available online, the more it just helps students that even if they missed something in that moment in the lesson, they can come back to it. The other side is assessment. For each point of knowledge or type of skill, you must have some way online that the student can demonstrate that they can understand the knowledge or they can perform the skill so this is the basis of teaching and learning from my perspective you know, when I was teaching you have to give the student an opportunity to demonstrate that they can do or they understand what it is that you're trying to get across to them so again that could be from a whole variety of different ways they could deliver that we'll go on to talk about some of the options that we give our staff but this is the core of our kind of you know where are we go in our vision for the teaching and learning and the um, IT teams working together to kind of create that fusion. You'll notice obviously that it's definitely a teaching and learning kind of vision because at the end of the day, yes, it is about the students. It is about getting them through and achieving at a high level. So that's where the, the vision has to start. And the IT work is there to support that goal. So that's a bit about where we're going. The next question is, how are we going to get there? So again, trying to keep this as simple as possible, we're saying that going forward, every course is gonna have a Microsoft Teams team. This wasn't the case this year, but the staff turned around and were able to set these up themselves and they were absolutely fantastic this year. Um, it's now the primary mode of communication with students uh, and has achieved in a very short space of time what we've not been able to do with students uh, over several years. We were never really able to get a communication platform that students consistently engaged with and staff could be sure that if you know you message students they will get it they will be able to respond they will do stuff we've tried you know email there was even some kind of stuff around like social network stuff like that but teams has as i say it seems to have achieved that in a very short space of time which has been fantastic staff this year as i say have set it up themselves next year we're going to help set that up ready for them ahead of time so just to make it a little bit easier so again that's a nice example of teaching and learning the IT working together we're trying to make life a bit easier the other thing that we've been doing for a couple of years now is that every course has a Moodle area and it's got a page for every unit so we say that it has to be available to students and it either holds the course content and assessment or if it's not there we ask that staff put something in there to redirect students to where the content is held because we do have some students uh, who work in particular ways with their lecturers that they don't do all that kind of content and assessment in Moodle and that's fine but we just ask that for consistency it redirects them across there so again how are we get in there trying to keep it relatively straightforward obviously after that point it starts to get kind of more complicated because one of the other issues is that teaching and learning is a really really broad and device uh, diverse kind of group We've got some groups that are working in kind of business administration, like it's, it's very familiar to IT, working with office applications, et cetera, things like that. This is something that IT is really used to delivering. We we'll, we'll say that's fantastic, it's great. You can work straight in Moodle, put your content in there, do an assignment. Um, you can submit that written Word document assignment into Turnitin if you want to do a plagiarism check, put it straight into a Moodle assignment if you don't, stuff like that. Um, Obviously, we've got other groups as well who work in different ways, though. For example, electrical engineers. Um, they're a great example of a group that they're doing a lot of portfolio work. So they have to assemble a portfolio of evidence for their assessment. Uh, and for them, OneNote is a much better place to do their kind of collaboration uh, and their 
content and assessment because they're able to work uh, collaboratively together in there. They can sketch and draw straight into pages within their OneNote portfolios, which is really good for kind of circuit diagrams, formulas, stuff like that. So that's a better platform for them. As I say, we're trying to keep it consistent. They, they can, they'll get redirected to wherever they're working from Moodle, but the idea is that we help them to work in the right place. Um, other things to say about this one, again, we're trying to kind of simplify it. I appreciate it probably looks a bit complex looking at this diagram initially, but believe it or not, before we were doing this, it was actually more complicated. Um, we had people working in all these platforms, plus Mahara, plus um, we had some working in Edmodo. Um, I think we had some others in another platform. Like there was just, there was no end of platforms and we've actually kind of rationalized it and kind of gone down to a, a smaller number of platforms so again it, it, this all helps to solidify your vision and keep people on track and unified in the fact that they know okay these are the places that I'm going to work in you know I don't have to go through quite as many decisions about how I'm going to work where I'm going to work and how do I actually deliver on that vision so again going back to that question there about like you know how we're following the vision so in terms of leadership the college I think has been really good about being consistent with the messaging from staff from leadership uh, they've also done one of the most important parts of leadership is they've actually backed up the vision with financial decisions uh, in terms of supporting and paying for the development of the platforms that we've settled on um, supplying uh, devices for staff and students to make sure they can actually engage with them uh, I think there's nothing that kind of turns off people quicker from your vision than if you ask them to do something that they physically can't do. Um, we went from a situation three years ago where most staff didn't have a digital device of their own. They were just working on kind of shared desktops, PCs, and it was always, you know, a really difficult sell to someone to say, hey, you should really go and do this e-learning stuff, get your content up online. And they just kind of turned around and looked at you and then pointed at a seven-year-old, you know, aging computer and you thought well, okay this is we're not going to get very far with this but now almost every member of staff now has their own uh, modern uh, device to work on which is fantastic it really helps so having that consistent message from leadership and backing it up uh, with the financial decisions uh, is really really positive and really important communication is the other thing saying the same thing over and over referring back to this stuff all the time so in discussions about planning for next year about which courses we're going to run about starting up new projects it keeps coming back to okay who's going to set that up who's going to get the content into Moodle how's that going to be connected what can we do to make it easier for staff next year starting to meet these things that we want them to do uh, so as I say that communication has been really key um, IT getting out there and communicating better is a really important one. Um, we're really bad, at least I would say, you know, from my experience at IT is that often we're out there, we're doing interesting things, we are trying to help people, but we're not necessarily very good at shouting about it. It's not necessarily our skill set. So we've been out there and asked marketing uh, for help, for assistance quite often to say, look, we've got all this new exciting stuff in, we're launching something new to help staff. Um, how can we promote that better to them? So that's been really useful about making sure that we're putting a really positive side to, on the kind of the new things we're doing. Um, targeting the communication for the audience as well is really important. So when we're kind of starting out on something new, Office 365 uh, has been a really, really big one this year. We've unified all our kind of Office 365 accounts and a load of work for that. My pitch for the IT team was, this is amazing. This is going to save you so much work. Uh, people will be able to do self-service password resets. Uh, they'll be able to recover their files themselves in OneNote, all this stuff. You know, it's going to be amazing for you guys. And then for the teaching and learning side, it's like you don't need to go to IT to get this file recovered. You can do it. You'll get loads more storage for stuff, you know. So pitching out that kind of messaging to people about the things that are going to make a difference for them is really important. So as I say, communication and targeted communication has made a big difference for us. Um, again, that making progress towards the vision possible is really, really important for us. For the IT teams, things that we've done that have actually made a difference is actually trying to get IT out to meet people. Um, so we've had members of the team who've ended up based in the staff base areas for short periods of time. Like, so maybe they've got like a day a week uh, and that's been really good because you often get staff coming up and asking questions and doing things that 
sometimes they might not come to the help desk necessarily for, or they delay or put it off. So kind of seeing that someone's there, uh, they can ask a question has been really, really good. So that's really helped for us on that one. Um, if you've got an opportunity to get into classrooms or get IT staff and things out to classrooms, it sounds crazy. I know it's kind of got its complexities sometimes, but it's actually really, really valuable uh, because you only have to sit in a classroom and see somebody struggling with getting an application open for five minutes in front of a class once before you're like, oh yeah, God, that's really, really bad. <laughs> we need to sort that. Um, so that's super valuable if there's an opportunity for that. Um, training for staff as well, kind of CPD uh, workshops, CPD days, events, things like that, that we run at the college. Again, trying to get IT staff out there to run training sessions with people. It's not necessarily their kind of, you know, their thing. Obviously they're in IT, they didn't sign up to, you know, be a teacher or a lecturer or something. But quite often these are the people who do understand the products the best. Uh, and it can, be be it can be good for them as well to kind of go out and explain it because people will ask them questions that, you know, they might not have ever thought about with a kind of a product or something, or you know, it helps them refine like, why are we doing this? Why are we trying to get people to do it? Um, so if you can encourage <clears throat> IT staff to get involved and stuff like that, that's uh, been something that's really positive for us. Um, meeting students as well, that actually even harder than meeting teaching and learning staff is actually getting some time with students. Uh, but we've had success this year with induction activities. Every single student went through uh, a library and IT induction this year. Uh, and various members of the IT team went out there to kind of deliver that induction. So they actually saw students face to face. Students, you know, saw like, okay, this is somebody from the IT team. I know that we've got an IT team now at least. Uh, and that's, so that's something that's really positive for kind of creating that connection. Um, the help desk team as well within your IT teams, I would say that those are people out there who actually probably spend more time talking to staff and students than other people. So getting other parts of your IT team to talk more to the help desk could be really good. Um, we've worked really hard this year as we've moved into teams and working remotely that we get the, uh, the kind of infrastructure team to put all their discussions in a channel together so the help desk teams can see that information because uh, sometimes it can be really useful. The help desk can get a heads up when there's a problem uh, and flip side, the help desk will sometimes post in there to say, hey, we're getting a bunch of tickets in about this particular problem. So even within the IT team, you know, there can be sometimes a bit of a divide you need to bridge there. So think about how you can use technologies to do that one. Uh, student associations are another one for kind of uh, bringing people together. I'd say that's a really positive one. Uh, if you can get them into meetings, again, they, they're kind of pressed for time, but if you can get them in, it's always fantastic. They always got really good feedback. Um, always remember that idea of obviously that feedback is a gift. Somebody telling you something that needs to be fixed. The alternative is they don't tell you and they're out there kind of saying, look, this, this is terrible. This is a terrible experience. Don't bother using it, et cetera. And it becomes very hard to win people back over. Uh, so it's a lot easier if they just tell you early and you can do something about it, you know, so as much as it can hurt to be out there and hear people say like, why do you make us use this? It's so old and clunky and unintuitive. They're actually being, you know, really helpful by giving you some feedback about that. So you should always be positive about that stuff. Um, I, only thing a caveat I'd put on feedback is be a little bit careful about survey feedback. Um, we've got quite a lot of projects where we have to show that, we're taking feedback about it. And there's always that thing of saying like, great, we'll have a survey, I'll email people, tick, done, roll on. Um, sometimes the feedback quality from surveys can be quite low. You know, people will put, you know, I'll give it four stars out of five, you know, but the fact that they're not, don't hate it does not necessarily mean that, you know, you're getting anything useful to kind of action on. So I know it can take more time to do kind of verbal feedback, but if there's any way you can add that in um, alongside surveys, it's definitely worth thinking about. Um, again, kind of thinking about the making progress towards the vision visible from the teaching and learning side. A lot of it, I would say, is kind of a bit of a kind of sales job from the IT side. IT needs to get out there and shout about what they do, look for opportunities to win over staff and buy them in. So thinking about what's actually going to make a difference for staff. Um, and a big one for that is always time saving. You know, so that's when we've launched this year, so when we updated Moodle for Moodle assignments, the ability for staff to leave audio comments rather than typed comments on work, you know, we were out there pitching that as, look, 
you can leave an audio comment in 30 seconds that you know would have taken you a couple of minutes to type out this is a real time saver so being aware of what makes a difference for staff what things they need help with what things would actually you know improve their experience and also from the student side as well if you're getting feedback from them about stuff they'd like you know think about how the product you're trying to push out the kind of things you're trying to do yes they probably are like a step forward but think about how does it actually make a difference to the people you're trying to sell it to um training staff in the way that you want them to teach students i would say is definitely a big one uh we've done some training events where we'll be in a classroom and we've kind of got laptops and things ready and we will ask staff to go to a Moodle page and do a Moodle activity and submit something and everything like that. So that's that's always really good because that's usually when you discover that it doesn't work quite how you intended it. But that's you know the thing where if you're putting staff in the position of being students themselves and they can see how it works, I think that's always a, a, a really effective way of doing it. And also the fact that you're committing to use it yourself, you know, if you if you're not prepared to do it yourself with staff, then why should they be prepared to pick it up and do it with their students is always a question. Um, this is one that Microsoft, I would say, is really good about at uh, their events. If you go to uh, the big shows like BET or something in London, they will have a kind of a, a mock classroom set up. You will sit down and you'll do a kind of a, a class activity with them, which is always a great way of saying, like, look, this is this is going to work. It's for real. <laughs> it's, you know, it's not just a nice razzmatazz presentation. You're actually in there. I realize I am, of course, like breaking that rule completely here by just sitting here and talking to you about it. But as I say, it's definitely it's something that's worked for us. Um, again, making that kind of progress visible, kind of a clarity less options rather than more for staff always helps um, if you've got really adventurous types out there they will go out and they will find all the cool tools and things like that they, they don't need any extra help like they'll they will go and do it and um, the staff that you need to win over generally i would say is the staff who's like you know what what product am i going to start with like you know i need to get my content up should i be putting it in moodle or should it go in one note or should it go in teams you know getting the options down as low as you can for them is always a help you know the, to try and bring that on ramp down definitely um the other thing that we've done this year to, that's really helped with us is we've had uh, people embedded within teaching and learning so independent learning specialists who are lecturers who get i think they get eight hours a week of time uh, set aside for an independent learning specialist role that's been really good because uh, you're overcoming that initial board barrier of like well, this is IT coming to me, a lecturer telling me what to do. You know, if you've already got someone in teaching and learning who's out there kind of championing what you're doing, it promoting all that stuff, that really, really helps. Because I think, you know, I'd say it's definitely a barrier. Um, I mean, I'm, I'm in a position where I'm lucky that I've, I have taught and now I work within the IT department. But very often, I think you do get some resistance there. And rightly so, that, you know people come in and telling you how to kind of change your teaching and learning who aren't teaching themselves so if you can find some way of getting champions out there you know as i say we're really looking at our position that we've had this kind of paid position paid role but uh, if you haven't got that just finding people that you can get out you know you can communicate to first you can champion stuff makes a big big difference um last point there i've got is the kind of fight to do less but do it better this is one, it, it's really, really big, actually. It's really important. The teaching and learning staff are time challenged. You really do need to be suggesting things for them to do that. If they're not directly a time saver and all the best, all the things that we've kind of promoted that have done the best have all been time savers. So kind of one note e-portfolios rather than paper ones, uh, teams rather than running around chasing people down in classrooms and sending them emails they don't go and find you. Those are two examples of like massive time savers that have kind of they've sold themselves almost. But if they're not a time saver, they need to at least be kind of like low friction, you know, something that's fairly easy to do. Uh, we've had a few services this year, ClickView uh, and materials from the Blended Learning Consortium um, that have been really good services for helping to get out there uh, and give lecturers access to more materials they can use with their students and they've been really easy to use. So again, that's really helped us to get out there and sell them. Um, be careful about reporting. I would say like, first rule obviously is like, if you're gonna do something and try something, you should, kind of promote it and say reporting wise like did what we do make a difference yeah definitely like it's 
completely sensible to say, yeah, I've, I'm going to spend time and money and effort on this. We should do something afterwards to actually check and see if it made a difference. You've just got to be wary that for the kind of reporting and things and measuring stuff afterwards, it can quickly spiral that the reporting takes as much time and effort to do as actually doing the thing you're reporting on. So by all means, find ways to report on stuff, find ways to get feedback, to get input on stuff like that. But just be careful around how much time it's going to take out of, you know, your activities. Is it going to actually help you get to where you want to go or is it going to slow that down? Um, other things for kind of fighting to do less but do better. Think about working with other organizations to make efficiencies. So again, ClickView uh, and the Blenders Learning Consortium I mentioned there, they're both examples of where we're we're buying in, we're paying for those services, but we're paying to save time for lecturers. They've got a lot of materials available ready already with the Blended Learning Consortium that they've got content for the areas that's relevant, wrapped up with some really nice formative learning assessment stuff, which is fantastic. That saves them time. Again, click view, loads of really good content, high quality out there, saves hours of searching around on YouTube for videos of questionable quality copyright questions you know and then are they going to be there in a year's time am i going to have to spend you know the start of next year going back around fixing all the broken links to videos so again it's not just about kind of your teaching and learning it teams there can be external organizations things that you could work with to save time so definitely definitely consider that um other things i'd say again about fighting to do less but do it better all the projects and things you're doing you should really be thinking about do they match up with that vision because we're always thinking about you know we could do this we could do that we could push this cool new product we could add this on sometimes yes that's the right decision to take you know you should be kind of pushing things forward doing something new sometimes projects will kind of overload things and what you'll see is it will slow down your progress towards the vision so all the kind of new projects should be pitched on the basis of this is how it helps us get to the vision and we do have the capacity to get there um, which feeds into project management is my kind of my last point i'd say if you've got some kind of knowledge within your organization about project management if you've got project managers there or people with some project management experience i would definitely say go and talk to them because these people are really good about helping to make sure that the projects you're doing are going to be effective they're going to be done in an effective way and they're going to help you make that journey towards the vision you're trying to deliver so that's my kind of journey through as i say this is just a bit about kind of like things we've tried and things that we've done that have been useful but i would say in a broader sense these kind of four points about helping people get towards the vision are probably valid whatever organization you are coming from so that's me i'll open that one up to talks so i'll i've got a link there about if you want to download the presentation uh, it's just bit.ly slash bridge divide one so if i say all my notes everything are in there if there's anything so i'll pop that one open for questions then Wonderful. thank you so much connor greatly appreciated i think if it's okay with kenji who is our editor we'll take one question then we'll wrap up for the recorded side of things and then we'll have a, an informal we'll continue the informal chat afterwards so there was one question that came through, Connor. Thank you so much for the presentation. That was really good. And it was, Frank, I don't know if you're in a position where you can unmute yourself and ask your question. If you can't, I can ask it myself. But Frank, would you like to chip in here? Try. Is that, is that me? Yeah. Yes. Okay. Um, thanks for the, the, the presentation, Connor. I took a lot away from that. Um, and I think the last slide you put up was one identified with most of all. I'm very much a believer in Occam's razor. And the simplest solution is often the best one. Um, so directly my question was, for example, we use Moodle. I'm from, sorry, New College Lanarkshire. We use Moodle extensively. And I teach CAD, computer-aided drafting and design. So we use technology and software and internet all the time. But my question is, uh, we haven't really utilized Teams at all. And we are obviously looking at that very closely now. Very, in fact. But I, I want to know, why would... Why would you want to try and, and operate with your students on two different platforms? What can you achieve through Moodle that you can't achieve from working with Teams alone? Yeah, no, I think that's a really, really good question. And it's been a, a big one that's been on our minds quite a lot, um, probably even before this year, but definitely this academic year. Um, 
ideally we'd love to come down like one less platform would be brilliant and i know microsoft are pitching teams as you know this could be your lms for the future uh they would really like that obviously they're dead keen on that idea um i think where we're still seeing a bit of a stumbling block that's stopping us just saying like let's just go into teams completely um is that Moodle allows you to create this kind of guided learning journey. You know, you can have a page there for the unit. It starts as an introduction. Now watch this video. Now come, you know, try this out. Now this is an assessment. Now I'm going to send you off to a link, you know, so you can have a whole kind of uh, learning journey through that. Um, and yeah, you can exactly, you can, you can really help, especially which it becomes really important when you know you're not seeing the students face to face at that moment if they're there on their own it's just them and the screen um having that kind of as much kind of help as you can to help them through is really important i wouldn't say teams is as good for that like if your content is in there you can have it in a kind of the files tab and everything that's great and it, it's really nice for working with it because you know you click it it drops you straight into the document to edit it that's really really slick um but there's no kind of way of kind of talking people through what you're doing so that's something we think Moodle offers as well. The other thing that we've kind of struggled with a bit is rolling over from year to year. Like, you know, people spend a lot of time and effort building these lovely kind of scaffolded experiences with all that information in there. And then at the moment, we've got a pretty good system where we can roll that over for next year. If the unit hasn't changed too much, they can roll on. If it has, they get a new copy of it and they just tweak the bits they need yeah. to. Mm -hmm. um, the teams, want it's a lot more complicated i know they've got some kind of features in there for kind of helping you roll it forward but um it's fairly complex i think it works at the secondary school and primary school level to a large extent it seems pretty good for that uh, but once you get up to kind of fe he you know it, it it's more complex and I'm, I'm not sure it's quite ready for that so that's that's where we are at the moment but I mean, Microsoft bought a kind of an LMS provider, I believe, like last year. So I'd be amazed if they haven't got kind of plans for addressing those kind of questions. Uh, and we would review that definitely in the future. Like things change, like, you know, and if, if a product adapts in a certain way or things become simplified or somebody's out there with a VLE that's, you know, does everything that Moodle does, but easier and things like that. You know, you've got to be willing to change as well. I think kind of flexibility, I didn't mention that in my slides, but being flexible about how you get to your vision is really important as well. That's fantastic. I'll take that back to the rest of my team because we're obviously debating that just now. So I've got an answer for them now. Thanks. Excellent. Thank you very much. So I'm going to draw the recorded part of the session to a close. Everyone that's online, you can stay online just now to uh, continue the conversation should you wish. Just a big thank you to Connor. Thank you so much for that. And I will just remind you that Tuesday to Thursday, the 16th to the 18th is Connect More. So please do consider joining if you like this sort of thing. Thank you very much. Goodbye for now.